Hi, everyone, and welcome to another Legends vodcast here on Eurosport. Uh, and, of course, I am joined again by the seven-time Grand Slam champion, former world number one, uh, Justine Henna. Justine, first of all, I got to go to you. Are you doing okay? Everything good, Matt. So far, so good. Um, we are in, in better situation, of course, slowly but surely. And it's good to see uh, the kids at the academy back on court and everyone going out a little bit more. We cross fingers that the uh, situation can uh, stay healthy uh, for everyone. But um, yeah, good weather and we try to enjoy the kids and, and everything and, stay, and remain positive. It's very important uh, in, in these difficult times for everyone. Yeah. Well, Justine, it's great to see you again. And today we are joined by a man who I would say may be the smartest tennis player out there because he's held a lot of jobs. He's, he was very early being a Davis Cup captain for the French team. He's now the tournament director of Roland Garros, uh, a good friend of us, Justine, and a great former player, Guy Forger. Guy Wonderful to have you with us. Uh, thank you so much. And, and the first obvious question is, how are you doing? Uh, of course, we're a couple of days after uh, here uh, that Roland Garros should have started uh, last Sunday, a couple of days ago. So what's going on? How are you? How's the family? Well, uh, hello, Matt. Hello, Justine. It's great to see you again. Um, as Justine correctly said, uh, I think we, it seems we're going toward a better trend now in terms of health. Um, in France and, and it seemed like over Europe because now things are starting to open up a bit. People are leaving their houses, are going back to work. People are going outside, play sports. Uh, the, the clubs, in most of the clubs in France have opened their gates uh, with some uh, sanitary measures. But, you know, people are going back on tennis courts again, which is a very good sign. Uh, I know Italy that have opened already that, that some of their restaurants and bars and probably France is going to follow in the next probably a couple of weeks. Which, which is a good trend. So uh, as you correctly said, Mats, um, it's a little sad to know that we should be playing some matches in Roland Garros right now and, and as we're speaking. But, um, you know, we are pretty confident that with that trend, you know, we'll be able to, to play Roland Garros on clay in autumn. Mm. Uh, it, I mean, Justine, I'm going to ask you because to me, this is so weird. I'm so used to going to Monte Carlo or, or watching it on TV, then Madrid and Rome and Barcelona. And of course, being in Paris, Justine, to you, this must be like, this is a very difficult time for even us that are not players anymore. It is for everyone. It is for tennis world, of course. Uh, I mean, you know, I've always spent my birthday at Roland Garros, so I don't know what I'm going to do this year, Mats. And uh, we need more to hear the the yeah the sound of the of the clay court and uh, Roland Garros is is so special, of course, for me. End of May, we should be there in Paris, enjoy tennis, but enjoy life also all together. And uh, of course, it's it's a strange time. It must be so strange for the players. Um, to be at home, it looks like they start to practice a little bit, but with no goals really and uh, no view on, on their calendar, which is yeah very, very difficult for all the players because they are competitors. They know, uh, they have to understand why they, they work so hard at the moment. And uh, let's be patient. It's the only thing, stay healthy, be patient. We, we only talk about tennis, but you know, tennis, sport in general, culture, uh, all these things are very important in, in our life. And uh, people want to watch more tennis on tv that's for sure and uh, we, we just cross fingers it's going to be for the in the next uh, few weeks or few months and uh, we have to remain positive even if we know it's going to be uh, very difficult yeah mm. uh Guy, um I, I think we're going to start with something that is very positive i can't wait to get back to roland garros we know you've been improving the facilities for the last few years and there's been a lot of pressure i would think on you but on the french tennis federation to finish the roof and so on so when we do get back to roland garros what do we uh, can we expect when we walk through the gates what's different uh, now compared to the last time it was played well, because that's why we were so excited because, you know, we've invested close to 400 million euros of, of, of our own money, you know, to, to make the place better, more modern. I think we were, we were a bit left behind uh, when you compare Roland Garros to the other Grand Slams. Uh, I think that gap has been now almost reduced because the, the Philippe Chatrier court now has been completely renewed. We have, we have the roof that's ready. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's functioning properly. You know, we've done, done it for the last months. So within 15 minutes, the roof can be closed, which is a positive sign. 
um, you know, we're going to be playing this year the quarterfinals on the Tuesday and the Wednesday on the Philippe Chatrier courts. So no matter what happened with the weather, you know, we'll be able to, no matter if it rains or not, we'll be able to fulfill those matches on those particular days. Court one is gone, which is a, a little sad because I, I know both of you and, and I did too. I played on that court. Uh, there was a lot of uh, very exciting matches, but you know, now it's, 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 it's an open grass area for people to, to walk around and to, uh, to watch uh, matches on the, on the big screen. Uh, of course, all the players area, uh, locker room, play restaurant, family uh, lounge will be uh, double in size. Uh, so uh, it'll be easier to move around. So, you know, you, you'll be seeing a lot of uh, new, new areas uh, in Roland Garros this year. And that's why, you know, we really want it because it's been such a big effort to, mm. to, to play the tournament and, 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 and to welcome, you know, all the tennis family with the media, fans, players, you know, in our, in our stadium. We're very proud. And Guy, can, can you tell us what's the atmosphere with the roof closed? Because it seems so strange. Yeah, now to, yeah without the fans, well, I know stuff, but... Uh, How yeah, you're right, Justine. It's, it's, you know, it's like, it's like Wimbledon. You know, the first time, you know, we witnessed a match, I think it was Amélie Moresmo, I think, who played one of the first matches on, on, on Wimbledon Centre Court when the roof was closed, when I walked in and I was in the box. It was so strange to see Wimbledon with a closed roof. Yeah. But, I mean, tennis weather, we want is a show now, and the show has to, to go on. And, you know, we have fans coming from Bordeaux, from Marseille, from all over, uh, from, from Brussels, you know, in Roland Garros, they've been waiting with their tickets in their hands with their family for so many months. And they take the train, they get to Paris, they go to Roland Garros, and when it rains and they cannot witness any game, any match at all, it's a nightmare. Wow. But imagine the frustration for these people that are, these kids have been dreaming about watching Rafa or Roger on center court, and then they have to fly fly back without seeing any, any matches. So, of course, it's going to be different. 95% of the times, I think the roof will be open. Of course. But on a few occasions, if we can, you know, conclude a match with the roof closed, I think it'd be so much better for the game and for all the fans that, that want to experience Roland Garros live. Mm. I, I think Guy um, and Justine as well, I think that the one big question that, that I think we all have is going forwards now. We don't exactly know when Roland Garros can be played. We don't exactly know what the preparation is going to be like, who, which players from which countries are practicing. So first question, uh, a, a, a quick one, is Roland Garros open now? Are the French players and maybe other players practicing there? Well, we have a few courts that are getting ready right now. So I think in the next couple of days, there'll be, uh, uh, or, or it, they're probably even, those two courts are probably ready now. So it'll be three, four, and five. But we have, you know, where uh, Jean Bouin, that has, you know, the, the club which is next door, you know, so these courts are open. Uh, and, and, and I know players have already started practicing again uh, around Paris. Some of them are in the, are in the south, are playing in the south. Uh, the good news is players all around the world now, it seems like they've been able to, you know, start preparation. It's going to be a long process, but uh, that's a positive news. And Paris, of course, I mean, the courts will be ready in the, in the next few weeks, all of them. Uh, Justine, uh, what can you imagine playing uh, Roland Garros without two or three weeks of tournaments on clay before? Because it seems we want the level at Roland Garros to be really high. But clay is not that easy to just start playing well on. No, you, of course it's not easy. Um, you, you need more time to get used to, to clay. It's very specific. Uh, also physically, you need to prepare completely differently. Here the possibility is that the players won't have too much time uh, and, and two grand slams, it's, it's a lot of pressure, but still. I don't know what, what you heard guys from, from the players, but uh, if they have the possibility to play, you know, and to, to be back on the circuit, to, to earn their the, the life also, and uh, to be there, to compete, even with no fans, we're probably going to speak about that, but in, we have to adapt and to adjust to the circumstances and uh, we have no choice. So it would be strange, that for sure, all these situations, but... It can be beautiful weather in Paris, uh, late September, you know, even mid-October. So I'm, I'm remain pretty positive on that. And the players will have to adapt. But I'm sure, and I don't know what Mats you think on that, but I'm sure that all the players, even with no fans, but the, to get the possibility to, to, yeah, to play their passion, the, the, the tennis, and be there, and it, it's their, their job, you know. So I, 
I'm almost sure they all want to be there, but they will have to accept the situation. Also, who is going to take advantage of that? It, it's going to depend also on how they can accept this new, uh, this new situation. And it's very hard for the players. They don't know where they go. And, and for sure, for the, the tournament director, for Guy, for the whole team, when you don't know really where you go and how you go, it's, it's something very difficult. But uh, uh, I'm sure the option playing without the fans is on the table now. And yeah, Guy, can you tell us a little bit more on that? Or? Well, it, it, it's something, you know, we, we've been working on as well. Uh, uh, we, we are in regular contact with the government. And ultimately, I think in any country, the, the, the government are the people who are going to give you the green light to, to go for it. Uh, they've been very supportive of the Tour de France and of Roland Garros. I mean, they, they, this probably the two events they really want to, to, to see in France happening, you know, in autumn. Um, uh, as we said before, the trend is, is, seems to be pretty positive now, so we can expect uh, things to get better and better, uh, you know, restaurants to open up again, small shows to go on, and then, you know, as uh, the weeks will uh, evolve, uh, you know, bigger stadiums. Uh, um, I mean, that, that's what we're counting on. Of course, we are studying as well uh, another is maybe less spectator. The mm -hmm. government tells you you can have the tournament, but not maybe the full capacity. You have mm -hmm. to have maybe one seat empty, every other seat. Mm -hmm. or So, you know, we, we are doing all the mathematical uh, possibilities, but of course, uh, our main goal is to remain Roland Garros as it is. Uh, now, we've been uh, working closely with the ATP and the WTA for the last few weeks as well, as, you know, correctly uh, Matt's mentioned. Uh, for players to play on clay before Roland Garros is, uh, we know clay takes a bit of time to, uh, to adapt. And, and, and for us, the clay season is really important, not just for Roland Garros, but for Madrid, for Rome. Uh, there are other tournaments that, that as well want to, to have the event happening. I mean, the uh, Italian Federation relies a lot on, 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 um, on the Italian Open to... to, to, to to, um, to have funds, you know, to, to pay the, 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 the schools, the coaches, the physio, the empires, and so do we. Uh, I mean, Roland Garros uh, probably brings 80% of the budget of the whole federation, so it's vital for us that this tournament happens because that's how we finance amateur tennis. Um, and I think a lot of other uh, tournaments are following that, 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 that uh, pattern as well and that trend. So uh, I know uh, Andrea Gaudenzi, uh, who has had, a, I guess, a tough start for his first year as the president of the ATP. You know, he's trying the best he can today to, to have a, a second half of the season with as many tournaments as possible. You know, we've heard a lot of rumors with two tournaments being played at the same time, even an ATP event during a, a, a Grand Slam on the second week. Uh, 250. I mean, we have all different scenarios, and um, we. I think it's important that we work to closely together now. That that as many players, you seen as you said, can make their living doing their job and their passion, and it's not easy. Um, I we we saw a tweet from the great Roger Federer uh, about uh, some thoughts that the ATP and the WTA maybe they, this is a good time to start joining together and be playing at the same time in the same venue, more like Indian Wells and Miami, and of course, Roland Garros and the other Grand Slams. Uh, what do you guys think? Is, is this, are we going to have one voice in professional tennis? Uh, is that possible? And should the women and the men be joined together more often? Justine, if I ask you first. Yeah, I'm not enough into it to really answer completely the question because uh, when, when I was playing, I was really in, in my bubble, you know, focus on my tennis and not asking too many questions on that. But when you look at it right now, I think it, it's also an opportunity today to think and to be creative, you know, for, for the future. Uh, the circuit is, is quite complicated also at this time. Players travel all over the world, you know, all the time. It's, it's maybe a time to think on how we can see the future of the tennis all together uh, would be, of, of course, the, the best. It's, it's probably, um, Roland Garros has been criticized of taking some decisions now, everything is clear, but it's not easy to put all the, these different structures on the table and to find the best solutions for everyone. So now I think that understands, uh, everyone understands that they have to be together and which is very positive and, uh, 
there are some possibilities, I think, and we need to be flexible for the future and maybe to reconstruct things differently because the, it, it became a little bit crazy. You know, these tournaments all over the world during the whole year and all these exhibitions and you know, all these new tournaments. And it, it, it's not easy also for, for the fans to understand what's going on. And uh, I hope that we're going to keep something simple also for the future. Mm. Yeah, Gee, I mean, you, you're, you're sitting in one of the hot, hottest chairs uh, in the professional tennis world and the amateur tennis world. Is it, is it possible that we can unify and have maybe one voice? Or is it more important that you are competing with Wimbledon uh, and the US Open? Because like you said, you thought you, Roland Garros was maybe slightly behind in certain aspects. And so the competition has actually brought your tournament up to the same level as Wimbledon. How do we deal with, with uh, some of these situations? Well, I think overall we have to look at tennis as a global picture. We want to attract more fans. We want to draw a younger generation to our sports. When you are a kid and that you have some, 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 some young children, you know, they can be attracted by basketball, by soccer, by all these great sports around. So uh, at the moment, I think there is a, a, a probably a bit of, a, of an issue with, a, with the governing of the game. You know, you have the ATP, you have the WTA, then you have the ITF, and then you have the Davis Cup and, and, and then the, and the four major tournaments. Um, of course, it's a business and everybody does what's best for them. So I think when Roger was saying, should be the time maybe that maybe the ATP and WTA join together, is it, I mean, I, I, I didn't speak to him about it, but is it in a term of a governing body? Like, should they speak as one voice? Uh, maybe that's what he meant. Uh, in, in terms of, of, the, of the facilities, of course, in Roland Garros or, or Indian Wells or Wimbledon, you can have men and women together. And I think that's, that's the best show you can have. It's, it's wonderful. Now in other tournaments, uh, it's just not possible. You know, you, I mean, there's not enough courts. There's not enough, I mean, it's just a, on one week events. Do you have a, a big enough facility to play both tournaments at the same time? Uh, that, that's another issue. Uh, and, I, and I can't answer to that. What I know is for the Rolex Paris Masters, which, you know, we run as a federation as well, you know, it, it can't be a, 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 a mixed WTA and ATP event because it's too small and we have to play in just one week. Um, so, but it seems like, you know, if, if, if they can join forces together, work on the calendar, on a lot of issues, I think that that, that could probably be a very positive idea that has to be explored. Uh, but probably Andrea and, and Steve Simon probably are going to get together in the future and see what they can do. And, uh, you know, I'm saying, why not? Mm. Uh, Guy, I got to ask you, um, because obviously you're, you're now famous for being the tournament director uh, of Roland Garros. For me, you're famous because you're the most free-flowing tennis game that I've seen. We got used to seeing the French players like they, 1991, uh, you managed to beat Pete Sampras in the Davis Cup final. Yannick Noah pulled Henri Leconte from the <laughs> rocking chair at home to play very gutsy moves. You made a gutsy move. Okay, so we got to ask you, the move you made to announce that the Roland Garros was going to be played in September, this was before any announcement was made. Where did that come from? And, and I mean, seriously, that was a lot of guts by the French Federation to come out with that announcement. How did that come about? Well, I, I, you know, to be honest, Matt, when it all happened, it went really quickly. And, and as you know, you know, we are a federation and we have a, 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 an executive committee that gets together and, and talk about these issues. And they are the one who vote, actually, who decides what's going to be done. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm like, of course, my voice is heard. I'm like, and then I'm a spokesperson and I, and I deliver whatever that, that executive committee decides, just like in Wimbledon, more or less. I think looking back, it was a, a very courageous move because as I told our president at the time, I said, Bernard, if we do that that way, of course, we're going to get criticized because we don't know what's going to happen. Uh, they're going to think it's a very selfish move. Maybe we can talk to them about it. But at the time, you know, our president's like, his responsibility is to save Roland Garros, to save the tournament, no, at, at any cost at all. So yeah. our goal was to say, okay, we have to save Roland Garros because otherwise our federation you know, is, is struggling. Otherwise, amateur tennis is going to suffer big time. So where could we possibly have Roland Garros without hurting any Grand Slam, without hurting the Davis Cup, without hurting any Master Thousand? 
where could we possibly place Roland Garros? And, and, and that time in autumn, as late as possible, was the time we thought that was going to be the less hurtful for everyone. But when you have a, you're running a Grand Slam event, I mean, they are the pillars of the game. You know, Wimbledon, Roland Garros, the US Open and the Australian Open are what people follow, no matter what. Um, and uh, looking back, I think it was, a, it was a good move. It was not probably brought up the best way in terms of communication. But I think if we pull that move and players finally play Roland Garros, make a decent living playing there, fans come out, you know, people will say, guys, it's so good that we we able to play Roland Garros than have no Roland Garros at all. And by the way, Julien Bouter, that you know, who is a tournament director of the MES tournament, which is the ATP 250, which is right during when Roland Garros was announced. After five minutes with our president on the phone, he said, Bernard, it was the right move. I'm, I'm going to be penalized big time because my tournament probably is going to be canceled. But Roland Garros is much bigger than any 250 in the world. And Roland Garros has to happen. I mean, they... That's Roland Garros make, make the sport uh, uh, successful in our country and we have to save Roland Garros no matter what. So um, it, was, it was, I think, a very strategic move and, and, and looking back, I think that's, you know, it was the right thing to do. And also, Matt, uh, they have been the first to take the decision. Roland Garros was the first to come in the calendar, which probably is not easy. So we can talk about communication the way, but I think it's, it's a big effort in sense also that uh, it's, after that, every, everyone had to sit together at the table and find the best solution. And Roland Garros can adjust now to that. But I, I think at the end, it, it created a certain dynamic, you know, for the future of the, of the season, which might be also interesting because when you have to put everyone at the table and find a good solution for everyone, maybe it takes more time also. So we can understand all the criticizes, but at the end, we can understand also the, the decision, I think. Yeah. And you right, you seen because looking back, even as we speak today, the schedule hasn't been announced yet because because you know we don't know who's going to go where. So imagine you know at the time if you would have said, oh listen, you know we want to move along. Where can we go? And we know some other tournaments wanted to take that spot in the calendar as well. You know we and and we felt maybe we should maybe go there, announce it, play it at that time, and then see what we can do. So uh, the positive thing is that the ATP and WTA joining together and we they got us around the table and finally things eased up and now we're working closely together yeah that's that's what i was referring to when uh i brought up the 1991 davis cup final yannick noah i called henri leconte you beat pete <laughs> sampras i mean the best team in the world america so i i understand that uh justine for you roland garros uh, means a lot of memories. You won there four times. What, what, what's, we have something on Eurosport uh, that's called You Say, We Play. Fans have voted to, for the most popular matches. Guy, I'm sure you have, you have some, of the, some of the most memorable matches as well. But Justine, for you, uh, there was a famous 2003 semifinal with Serena Williams. Uh, you have so many matches. Tell me, what, what, which match would you actually sit in the chair and watch yourself play at Roland Garros? I, I, I have to admit, I'm, I'm not too, too ob objective, you know, with Roland Garros because it's, it's in my heart and I try to really stay neutral. But uh, look back now, I was 10 years old and I, I had the chance to go and, uh, and I was invited to watch uh, Steffi Graf, Monica Celeste in 1992. And uh, I was 10 and uh, yeah, Graf lost 8-6. I was a big fan of Steffi and she, she lost 8-6 in the third. And uh, I grabbed my mom, you know, and I said, one day I'll be on this court and I will win the tournament. And um, she looked at me, you know, like this, like say, okay, she's a bit crazy, but yes, my dear, you will do it. So when it, when it happened in 2003, after this, this crazy semifinal against Serena, it was something quite, quite amazing, the, the atmosphere. And uh, I, you know, I live 300 kilometers from Paris as, as Belgian, of course, Roland Garros, uh, for all of us mean, mean uh, a lot. And uh, it's almost like home. It's almost like a, a garden. So um, yeah, that's why I, I'm very uh, 
very excited i hope to go back there in in a few weeks a few months and uh yeah that match against serena is probably the one that i would watch again that's for sure and uh and you, Matt, because everyone is talking a lot about the, the you know, the final against Noah, but I, I'm not sure that we want to talk too much about that today. Uh, was that in, yeah, in 85, the final against Lendl or, or another one, you think? No, I think it was the final in 1985. The problem with the finals in 1983, when uh, Yannick Noah beat me, uh, is that it was five years uh, before I won in 1988. So Yannick would call me up, let's say, on the 20th anniversary, and he would say something like, hey, Matt, uh, the French Federation would like to do an anniversary of my win uh, 20 years ago. I said, well, hold on. It was 25 years of my anniversary. So I actually never get to celebrate my 25th anniversary, 30th, because of the Yannick Noah. Not true at all. Guy has been very nice, uh, brought me on the court uh, a couple of years ago to celebrate my three victories. So, yes, Yannick Noah, a very important match in, in 1983 for the French Federation, for French tennis, which is huge. 1985 for me was big. But, but Guy, for you, uh, I think the Roland Garros for us, Justine, is finals and semifinals and, and these big clashes, you and Serena. For the French tennis player, Arnaud Clément, and Fabrice Santoro played on Suzanne Longland. I mean, these are some classic matches that might not be shown around the world, but in France, tennis is a lifestyle. So Guy, for you, give me something that makes me feel sick in my stomach that I'm not coming <laughs> to Roland Garros uh, this spring. Another match. Well, it's, I'm not going to mention about my matches, Matt, because, I mean, you and Justine have done so much in our tournament, in the history of the game as well. You've risked an history on our courts. But, you know, looking back at, at that site, uh, I mean, I'm not if the, if the people know, but Roland Garros has been built for, for, for the Musketeers, for the French Musketeer who has, had beaten uh, Bill Tilden in Philadelphia in 1927. So that, actually, that actual site was built for Davis Cup for these great four champions who won Wimbledon. They won all the, all the major tournaments. And um, uh, as, as all the British players that do great matches on any court at Wimbledon, I mean, the atmosphere and, and the so expectations are so high that whenever a local French player is playing, people come and, 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 and support with so much enthusiasm that it's, 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 it's wonderful. And sometimes it's counterproductive because in my case, or in the case of Amélie Moresmo, which you know very well, uh, had, a, had a tr uh, some problems to deal with that because it's so big and so high that, that sometimes you play a little bit tight and, and when you're not loose, you don't play your best game. So, um, uh, uh, you know, I, I, have, I have a lot of memories of French guys who, who did great. Uh, I mean, Henri, uh, and you beat Henri in the finals match as well in Roland Garros one year, and, and Yannick, and of course, uh, a lot of other players. Cédric did well, Grosjean did very well in Roland Garros, uh, beat Agassi one time in a big match, uh, I think it was in the quarters. Uh, Joe Wilfried Songa, I think, had match points against Novak Djokovic, probably in the quarters as well. So there is a lot of matches where French players um, uh, were involved and I'm sure we'll see a lot more uh, in the future. Um, we have um, uh, some young players that are coming up. Uh, we have uh, still guy like Gael Monfils who's ha had a great uh, beginning of the season and, and, and he's probably the one who can do really good in Roland Garros because he has, I think, the, the very good game for clay. Uh, hopefully he will mature a, a, a little bit more <laughs> in uh, in 2020 as well, um, but it's it's um, you know every year when I when I go through the gates uh, and I know something is going to happen. Uh, of course, you know Rafa has been very possessive about the whole place for the last 14 years, uh, 15 years in Roland Garros. <laughs> He's been a lot more open with the ladies. Um, but, you know, then again, we had Kristina Mladenovic, uh, Caroline Garcia, who both went to the quarters, they won the doubles. Uh, I mean, Roland Garros is a, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a wonderful celebration. It's a world mm -hmm. championship on clay. And once again, uh, that's where I think the top players and, and, and you guys have done it. You, you know, you, you, you write the history of the game there. 
Mm. Uh, yeah, so no, I, I think that what, what, uh, what's important to understand for the, for the rest of, of the world and, and people listening into Eurosport is that uh, tennis in France is, I think, is the third, second, third biggest second, sport, maybe. The second biggest sport after soccer. See, that doesn't happen in other nations, maybe in smaller countries, maybe in Belgium when you were at your best, Justine and Kim Clusters were at their best. But, but it's a lifestyle. It's a necessity. Uh, it's basically a, a religion of form to be uh, so. So I, I don't even know what to say. I, I hope that Roland Garros will happen. Um, in terms of a prediction, Guy, uh, what do you think the season will look like once the tournament starts? Is, are they going to be played at the, the date they have? Are we cancelling the whole year if, if the majors don't get played? I mean, wh what's your feeling at this particular time? Well, it's still so early now that I think it, it, it's hard to, to predict because we're still a few months away. So, so many things can happen in between today as we speak and when the tournament starts. Hopefully... Uh, and I'm pretty confident some tournaments will happen before Roland Garros. And I think that's for the good of the game and the good of the players. Uh, I want to think that when the tour will start again, I think the players with more experience will, will still be on top. I think when, when you're a younger player, you need to put those four or five hours a day and to get some the rhythm and the confidence of the matches. I think a Roger Federer, a Nadal, a Djokovic, with little less practice, they can rely on their experience and they can still be there on the big moments. Uh, so my, my call would be watch out for the older guys. I think they still be here when play will, will resume. Probably the same with the, with the ladies as well. But now maybe you, I don't know if you have a different opinion, but uh, I think they've been so good last year and the, and the first part of the season, Novak has been unbelievable. I mean, Roger is just playing uh, when he's fit. I mean, the, his best tennis and yeah. Rafa, he seemed like he's a junior walking out on every court anywhere in the world. Like, you know, he's so happy to be here. Yeah. So, um, you know, I look forward uh, when the game will start again to see all those guys, because I think we, we, we uh, and these girls as well, you know, uh, I mean, women's things as well as, 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 as seen uh, with Ashley Barty, I think uh, a, a great improvement, some great girls playing wonderful tennis. And I look forward to see all those players coming back on court with that, passion and that hungriness to, to, to just show what they can do on the court. Yeah, Justine, I got to ask you this, because obviously uh, you have grown up, and Guy, you as well, when you came up out on tour, uh, in the beginning, you play big matches in front of no people at all. You, normally, not on Philippe Chartrier, but maybe on court uh, nine or 10 or something like that. But for you, Justine, somebody like Serena Williams, She's looking for a 24th major. Uh, who's the favorite on the women's side in terms of playing pot potentially with, with no fans, but who's able to uh, compartmentalize and just go out there to win another big tournament? Is it the same as what Guy is saying with Rafa and Roger and Novak? It's a, it's a good question, Mats, because uh, if the, 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 the players have to play with no fans, it will, it will be a big adjustment for, for everyone. It's going, it could be a unique situation, but if we take that from side, if we come back to normal situation, which we hope, but we don't know, um, I have the feeling the experienced players also will, ta will, will take advantage uh, on that. Serena, it's getting harder and harder, but uh, maybe it's an opportunity to take a good break also to recover because from the time she's been a mom, you know, she didn't really uh, have a good recovery and she started to play uh, quite soon after that. So and running after the title, playing a few finals of Grand Slam. So it's, it could be an opportunity for her. But we spoke to Simona Halep. It looks like the motivation is, uh, is big. And in the last few months, I would say from last year, the, the women's tennis has became again more interesting, I thought. I was a bit concerned in, in the past and, and we, we saw different kind of styles also coming back on the tour with Ashley Barty, with Andrescu uh, and, and some players I have some difficulties, but we see, uh, I think, different kind of, of styles and I like that. So it's going to be very open. It's not the same situation as the, on the men's tour for sure. But the, the one who were playing well, I think, as Guy said, will be there. Uh, because mentally they will be fresh, the motivation will be there, and the experience will be there also. 
So let's see how the young generation is going to, yeah, is going to play in that kind of situation. If they start to think too much, you know, and to take a lot of energy right now, it's going to be complicated also for them uh, coming back in a few months. And at the same time, Guy, maybe last question goes to you. Is this the time this year when a French player can maybe have a chance to, <laughs> to win again? I mean, it could be a slight advantage to the French players and what would it mean, again, for French tennis to have another Yannick Noah victory? Yeah, I don't want to wish him uh, any bad luck if, if, uh, for the one who's going to win it again. I don't know when that's going to happen. Uh, lately, it seemed that the top three guys were so good. Although Vavrinka, I mean, Stan has been played that year the best tennis of his life and has beat you know, the top guys in, in, a, in such a wonderful manner that you can wish that uh, uh, Gael Monfils or Tsonga could reach that level for two weeks. Now, now that's easier to say than, than to do. Um, because it seems when those top three guys are at the best level, uh, they're so consistent and they always find a way to pull out a win. Even if they're struggling, even if you know, it's windy, even, I mean, they're always there. Um, so maybe, maybe, uh, I know one day will come that, that one of the French guy or French lady after Marie Pierce will probably um, win Roland Garros and, and uh, uh, the sooner, of course, the sooner the better. But, um, uh, you know, that's what we're working for with the Federation. That's what Monet's invested is to, to, to once again bring more kids to the game and, and, and because that attracts more fans. And, and, uh, and that's why we are able to, to offer such a great show and a great, a tournament to, to the to the people all around the world uh, but overall i think you know tennis has to be the winner mm. uh, if it's a french bet it's better of course but if it doesn't matter i mean yeah. if, if we want people to leave the gates every evening you know going back to the to the metro to the cab to the hotels going oh my goodness that was a great show i want to i want to come back to this place and that, that's, that's my goal today. And that's what we're working for for the last few months now is to, to bring that passion to the, to the fans. I can only hope that we're coming back as soon as possible. Justine, I know that you're feeling uh, uh, energized and more positive after we've heard some, some words from Guy here. So, uh, Justine, it's great to see you again. Thank you very much. Guy, what a pleasure. Thank you for, for being the voice uh, the same voice of uh, the, the French Tennis Federation. I wish you good luck. I know it's a very difficult situation to be in. Um, we'll see you soon and again. Uh, tune in to Eurosport, please. We got some tennis for you uh, throughout the next couple of weeks. But, uh, man, am I hoping to go to Paris in September. So good luck to Guy and, and Roland Garros. Justine, great to see you again. Thanks, everybody, for listening and watching. And I hope everybody stays safe and healthy.